This video will review briefly the origins of St. Benedict's Monastery, its first early chapels, the construction of Sacred Heart Chapel. There aren't any photos for the dedication ceremony, but we conclude with the uh, photos and explanation of the consecration ceremony in 1943. We dedicate this video to Mother Willibalda Scherbauer. Mother Willibalda Scherbauer was our foundress because she led the group of Benedictine sisters from Pennsylvania to Minnesota and kept alive the dream of a mother house that would have its own freestanding church. She lived to see the completed chapel in 1914. Our founding abbey in Eichstätt, St. Walburn, nestled in a valley among the hills of Bavaria. It was a cloistered abbey in which the sisters conducted a boarding school for girls. It was here to this abbey that Boniface Wimmer, a Benedictine monk missioner in America, came in 1851 to beg the sisters to come to the New World to teach the children of the German immigrants. Mother Benedicta Reap led a group of three sisters to America she is venerated as the foundress of the Bavarian branch of Benedictine Sisters in the United States. The following year, in 1852, they were taken to an abandoned mission in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, from which eventually sprang the numerous daughter houses that spread through the various parts of the United States. One such daughter house was founded in Minnesota Territory in 1857 by Mother Willibalda Scherbauer. The sisters settled first in St. Cloud, in the complex of school and church, now known as St. Mary's Parish. In 1863, after six years in St. Cloud, the sisters moved to St. Joseph upon the invitation of the Benedictine monks, who were the pastors of the parish. There, though the parish church served as their main place of worship, they opened a small convent chapel in the link between the parish log church and the convent. After eight years in St. Joseph, the sisters began to build a mother house. The first building, St. Cecilia Hall, was half convent and half academy. Within two years, they added Benedict Hall, and after another nine years, they built the third hall, Scholastica Hall, to accommodate their growing membership and that of the academy. This diagram shows where the first chapels were located in these buildings. The sisters, however, continued to go to the parish church for their main liturgical events until 1890 when they had their own resident chaplain, Father Henry Borgadine, who served as chaplain for 38 years. In the first edition, Cecilia Hall the study hall also served as a chapel. In the second edition, 
Benedict Hall, they had built a chapel on the second floor. But in the third, Scholastica Hall, they provided for a large chapel that actually constituted the second and third floors of that building. This is a view of the chapel in Scholastica Hall. It was called Sacred Heart Chapel and had a capacity of 300. It was fully furnished as a church and beautifully decorated. Note especially the pipe organ in the balcony. Mother Wildebalda was a musician, so the sisters were never without a rich liturgical service for prayers and the Eucharist. The two women who set the pace for the community's second 50-year period, Mother Cecilia Capster, Sister Priscilla Schmidtbauer, Mother Cecilia Capster was certainly a builder, both spiritually and materially. Her physical plant manager, or what we, we call a procurator, was Sister Priscilla, who was a astute businesswoman and wasted no time in carrying out the plans of Mother Cecilia. On April 19th, the chapter decided that there should be a, a freestanding chapel. And they decided that at the same time they would add another hall, Teresa Hall, to the academy in order to uh, accommodate the growing academy students, but also to begin a college. Mother Cecilia Capster and Sister Priscilla journeyed through the eastern states to look for chapels and churches and monasteries. The one thing that impressed them the most were the altar and the pews and the choir stalls that E. Hackner from La Crosse, Wisconsin had made. It was Hackner who recommended George P. Stadahar as architect for the new chapel. So by September, Stadahar had some of his architectural details worked out and estimated that the chapel would probably cost about $50,000. Well, they found that fell short when they tried to get contractors. When they raised it to 125000 the Butler Brothers of St. Paul took the contract for 8% of the cost of the chapel. The final cost of the chapel was actually close to 200000 But this photo shows where they had to place the chapel. The first serious discussion of the site of the new chapel was done in late 1910. They proposed a drawing, an architectural drawing, that suggested that the chapel be built at the east entrance of the comet, which would be uh, in the front. What, what we see here is the backyard of the, um, the monastery. So uh, in the front, they planned to have the chapel. They asked the, ch the ch uh, village to move the street, college, now College Avenue, so that they could put the chapel there, but the village never agreed to that. Uh, the rumor has it that they were actually ready to pay $20,000 to, to the village for the removal, but it never materialized. So they picked up the plans for their uh, chapel and uh, jutted it into, into the back door of the convent of Benedict Hall. Upon making the final decision to build the new chapel on the west end of Benedict Hall, some of the auxiliary buildings, such as the pigsty, poultry house, old carpenter shop, ice house, and lumber sheds had to be moved further west. Remember, this area had served as the backyard before 1910. Finally, the site was ready and groundbreaking began on October 5, 1911. Notice the sizable turnout to celebrate that event. Sisters, students, townspeople, and even horses. The outline of the foundation of the chapel shows the extent of this building. The extreme length is 157 feet, the width of the nave is 60 feet, and the transept 110 feet. This view from the west also shows the proximity of other buildings. The upper portion shows Marmion Hall, which is built as a boarding school for Indian girls, and later became a boarding school for little boys as a department of the academy.
To the left is the infirmary, which was built as a kind of hospital for students that had contagious diseases. Hence, it became known as the Pest House. That was later moved closer to Minnesota Street and is now our guest house. Within a month of laying of the foundation of the chapel, the walls of the dining room below the chapel were raised. Pouring the cement for the concrete ceiling of the dining room created the floor of the chapel and prepared for the raising of the walls of the chapel. The cement is being poured by hand to pails. It's remarkable that the floor could be completed in a month's time in this manner. The two buildings in the center background are worthy of note. To the left, the powerhouse, and to the right, the laundry or Loretta Hall. They would remain in place for another 70 years and serve multiple purposes. The four walls of the chapel are up. This view of the west end of the chapel shows a nave that housed the two sacristies. The one to the north was for the priest and their vestments. The one to the south for the sacristans, who used it as a kind of greenhouse to nurture the plants that decorated the altars. On October 13th, all was in place for the laying of the cornerstone. The Butler brothers are all dressed up for the occasion. This cornerstone is still in the chapel, at the base of the first pillar, to the left of the font, as one enters the chapel, by the holy water font. In this view, one can see how close the barn is to the chapel, and it remained there for another forty years, when it, too, was moved farther west. An enclosed cloister walk, which was constructed to connect the second level of the south side of the chapel to the second level of Teresa Hall of the college. Because later photographs show this south court area without a cloister walk, it may be assumed that the construction workers had to remove the cloister walk probably to give more space for the ensuing construction work. However, photographs of 1914 show that the enclosed north and south cloister walks were added to the chapel immediately after the completion of the chapel. One week after the steel girders for the inner walls were installed, the steel supports for the stained glass windows were in place and construction of the inner walls had begun. The outer walls provided for a circular cloister walk around the chapel to divert the traffic from the monastery to the, to the college and maintaining a peaceful silence in the chapel. In this view, I uh, show the size of the chapel proper. By the end of November, this chapel was ready for its roof. Note the strong steel supports for the roof. Also, within the steel supports for the roof of the chapel, a large circular steel support was inserted for the dome and a smaller support to the left for the skylight over the main altar. The Kilmer family's donation of the Holy Spirit stained glass circular window was installed in 1935. The scaffolding to complete the building of the dome helps one appreciate the danger of working on this structure, particularly since this part of the construction work was done in the winter months of ice and snow. An oral tradition has it that one of the workers slipped from this dome and fell to his death, much to the sorrow of the community and the construction workers. The chapel dome from floor to ceiling of the dome is about 120 feet. The height of the chapel to the tip of the cross on the dome is 135 feet. Because there was no main entrance to the chapel, a link was constructed between the chapel and the convent. This photo shows another aspect of having to complete the work on the, on the chapel. The sand needed for the construction of the chapel was found in a, in a large pit just south of the chapel construction. And uh, when they came to close that area, they decided it was too large. It would take too much hauling 
to close that, and so instead they made a cistern and a root cellar out of it. It still exists today. On entering the chapel from the east, the first object that captures the eye was the high altar because of its artistic design in pure white Carrara marble, inlaid with sienna panels, of which there is no duplicate the sisters wrote in their chronicles. Note the baldachin, a wood carved in Italy, as were the angels who held up the crown, a worthy canopy for the altar. The altar was surrounded by eight columns of old convent sienna marble resting on the bases of Georgia Creole marble. This baldachin altar were mounted on the sanctuary floor, which was four feet higher than the chapel floor, to ensure an unobstructed view from any point in the chapel. There were 24 columns and pilasters in the chapel and sanctuary. The beauty of this granite is perhaps not equal by any other granite in the United States. In the beginning, the chapel was sufficiently lighted by natural daylight. However, as colored glass windows were installed, a complex lighting system had to be provided day and night. The interior chapel reminded people of a white palace of prayer. There were no decorations at first. The lovely gumwood pews in the east nave were of wood floor, which was built on an incline of 18 inches from the dome to the east entrance. The crossing transept under the dome was occupied by 144 choir stalls for the members of the community. The entrance to the east was the main entrance of the church, but it entered immediately into the common corridor. There was no public main entrance. The choir loft railing was of terra cotta. The organ, which I mentioned before, as was moved from the old Sacred Heart Chapel in Scholastica Hall to the squire loft. The only th change was that they put an electric motor so that it would not have to be paddled by foot. There were four side altars dedicated to the Sacred Heart, the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and the Pieta. The Way of the Cross was mounted on the south and north walls of the chapel. Two stations are shown midway between the side altar to the left and the Pieta nave to the right. These stations from the old chapel were painted to harmonize in color and they were transferred to the new chapel in 1914. These stations were donated by Mr. and Mrs. Majerus of St. Cloud. That first pillar to the very left is the one that contains the uh, cornerstone. On the south side are engraved 1912 and a cross and on the east side, U-I-O-G-D, which represents the Latin phrase, Ut in omnibus glorificator Deus, that in all things God may be glorified. These are the entrances to the chapel. The entrance into the convent. Entrance on the side of the chapel, which was the only accessible entrance when visitors drove on the campus, the door was sort of hidden under cloister walks and was very difficult to find. This aerial is a southeast view of St. Benedict's Monastery when it was completed in 1914. The public blessing prayers throughout the building process occurred as follows. Groundbreaking, October 5, 1911. Laying of the Cornerstone, October 13, 1912. Dedication of the Chapel, March 3, 1914. Vigil of Consecration, October 23, 1943. Consecration of Sacred Heart Chapel, October 24, 1943. The Archives does not have copies of the first three ceremonies. The actual consecration of the chapel had to be postponed until the community was debt-free. The debt incurred by the construction of the chapel and Teresa Hall and the ensuing poor World War I national economy was followed very quickly by the debts incurred by buildings hospitals in Bismarck, North Dakota and in St. Cloud, and that was followed by the Great Depression of the 1930s. After the Depression, 
It took the community about 10 years to become debt free. So, on October 24, 1943, the chapel was finally consecrated. There are some photos of the vigil preparation on October 23rd and of the consecration ceremony following that day. This photo shows the great care that was taken by the sisters, assisted by some college students, to prepare the repository for the relics that would be placed in the newly constructed altar. They conducted an all-night vigil to venerate the relics. Then the consecration rite included a procession in which the relics were carried around the entire exterior of the building to bless it. The consecration was a long five-hour ceremony that included at least three processions around the outside of the chapel in blessing it. The prayer of that ceremony expressed the depth of meaning that the sacred role of the chapel has had and continues to have in the life of this community. May the blessing of thy presence in this place spread to its outermost boundaries and pervade its porches on every side. May all its corners and inmost parts be laid by this cleansing stream so that gladsome peace, gracious hospitality, religious reverence, and the abundance of the means of salvation may never fail in this place. During the three processions, every time that the bishop passed the entrance of the chapel, he knocked at the door with the foot of the cross and asked for admittance of Christ in this chapel. Again, the prayer reveals the profound meaning and spirit of this ritual. May thine invisible cross be set on this threshold, and both doorposts be marked with the sign of grace, and of the greatness of thy mercy, may they who visit this house find peace with plenty, sobriety, moderation, and compassion. The bishop then anointed the walls of the chapel in twelve places. Today these places are marked with candles that are lit on feast days, in particular on October 24th, the anniversary of the consecration of the chapel. The prayer of anointing is still relevant today. And when we call upon thy holy name, do thou send down the fullness of every good gift, and put evil temptations to flight. May we be found worthy to have with us the angel of peace, chastity, charity, and truth, who may ever guard, shield, and defend us from all evils. The altar was anointed, and the relics were placed in the altar stone. A pontifical high mass concludes the five-hour consecration ceremony, and we all remember that it was a very cold day. The final appearance of the completed chapel, 1914. This is how the chapel looked until its renovations in 1980. Notice the roof. With its colorful tiles, they were asbestos to make sure that this chapel would never burn. Note also the wonderful rural area and how the community was nestled within the town of St. Joseph. go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. For the love of my family and friends, I say peace be upon you. for your good. Let 
to the 